It was in the UK when somebody told me that I had the most incredible voice they'd ever heard. Really? I said, me? Me? But we're American. I think I'm just conditioned that my voice is annoying. And I don't think, I don't know why. I Your think voice I'm just is not like, annoying. I think it's just like the American. I'm like, oh, I just assume people don't like the way Americans talk. Have you ever like um, talked to a foreigner or something and um, like perpetuated the own stereotype of it? So like, um, like I was, yeah, I, I recognize my own Americanness. So oh, yeah. I was like, oh yeah, and then we're going to go down. Welcome to TikTok Theology, a podcast that tackles the major trending topics on social media that concern the Christian faith. I'm Megan. And I'm Steven. We know you can't form a theology in three minutes or less, but those videos can identify current issues. TikTok will give us the prompt and then we'll do a deep dive. Thanks for joining us in this exploration. Hello, friends, and welcome back. We are uh, hitting the ground running. We're getting close to halfway through the season. So Mm -hmm. exciting news, exciting things. Um, We have so many good episodes left, but this day (laughs) we are diving into um, transgenderism and uh, more specifically, we're diving into the question, is transgenderism Gnostic? So Mm. we're kind of approaching this conversation from a little bit of a different perspective and from a different theological viewpoint than necessarily us being like, oh, don't do it or like we're kind of we're there's some nuance to this conversation that we're going to present to you guys today. Yeah, I think um, we're going to talk about it philosophically in a way that says, why do people have these thoughts towards transgenderism that seems to like not mesh like what's going on Mm -hmm. and see if we can diagnose a thing which I think I might have thought of something like it got hit the other day. You know what I'm saying? Like a brick. I was like, ooh, this might be a thing. I have that. It could not be a thing. It could not be a thing. And I mean, we'll put it up for dialogue, you know, if people are like, hey, that's definitely not a thing. You should stop saying that. Then, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. But we made, we, we are having this conversation. We hope, you know, it offers something, but obviously, um, transgenderism along with the, um, various other elements of the LGBTQ plus Mm -hmm. community is a topic of conversation, especially because with social media and all the things, and this has been a thing for much longer than just Mm -hmm. the rise of social media. And we've seen it frequently over the course of, you know, the last hundred years. It's, you know, it's not a brand new concept. No. Um, And it goes dates back, you know, much longer than even just the current, (laughs) current centuries in which we live. But it's definitely something that we've been seeing much more of, even with like creators like uh, Dylan Mulvaney, who did the um, like hundred days of being a woman and it was a transgender man and he got sponsored by like Bud Light for that second. And mm. there was a whole backlash about why, like <laughs> why you would be the sponsor, all that kind of stuff. So there's been a lot of um, Laverne Cox, like that kind of stuff. There's been a lot of yeah. um, media time given to these creators who are transgender and it's bringing up these aspects of conversation. And, as always, the Bible, scripture, theology also has uh, something to say in these aspects of our culture in this conversation. So yeah. we're going to dive into that. Yeah. So I think one first point that we should make is that sexual ethics deals differently with transgenderism than LGB, right? Yeah. So LGB, there is a sexual preference that's going on. And so, yeah. um, but this is different. This is about like a gender identity. Yes. So even just um, like as we start talking about LGBTQ as like one category. Right. That's sometimes even hard to do Mm -hmm. because a transgender person may be gay or straight depending on how it is. Right. With gender dysphoria, that actually becomes really difficult to define. Yeah. Or then you fall into the non-binary categories and Mm -hmm. stuff. (laughs) It's definitely a wider category that has a lot of nuance even within each identification point. Right. So I think that's important topic sensitive of course any of these things are sensitive one thing is media can be Mm -hmm. used in such a way that it can like ignite passion towards people and it could ignite violence yes towards people in lgbtq communities Mm -hmm. and that's not good violence and rhetoric and then like or if you say things so strongly and without without you know care yeah then somebody can repeat it and it, it can like be used in a way that it inspires someone that is not right yeah and then they can do violence so definitely want to do these things with care because we are not for violence we are for um you know compassion and loving towards people yeah even as we call things sinful we don't change our demeanor of what how we should be towards anyone no it doesn't change their status as an image bearer right regardless and so that's that's why I don't enter this in trepidation of just like being able to talk about anything. Mm -hmm. Like, like I think 
every matters of philosophy and theology should be discussed. Those are discursive subjects and they're much better when we can talk through things and, yeah. and enter them into public discourse. That's the whole point, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, um, but the thing I'm afraid of is, is how things can be misconstrued and how they can be used for violence or anything like that. Yeah. So I think that's why we're going to spend a lot of care try, trying to talk about this, yeah. trying to help people understand each other. I think that's what this is much more about is like, understanding differences and understanding um why we might believe certain things yeah. without you know having any sorts of condemnations that mm -hmm. being said in our in our episode last season yeah you know we talked about lgbtq community we talked about them as sexual sins you know biblically mm -hmm. sexual sins and and we're not like not saying that that's that is the case yeah but here we need to come with uh with a loving demeanor of how, some care. We, how we talk about yeah. some care when you keep your theology up here mentally mm -hmm. it, it feels one way but it's an entire other thing to live out your theology yeah. and i think that there's nuance where we can say you know mentally you're like oh that's a sin whatever and then practically yeah. there's people on the other side of your theology mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's when we have to be really intentional about um communicating um truth and love yep <laughs> yeah. and um in a way that is dignifying and respectful because I think that the Christian community has done a huge disservice in any of these kinds of conversations about gender identity or sexual orientation because there has been no care or dignity ascribed to people yeah. who are either in that lifestyle or struggling in, in their sexual sins in that sense. For sure. So that's, that's the fine balance of like, of being able to bring this up in a public discourse because there's things that are said from one side that you just may not agree with yeah. and you should be able to talk about it. We, mm -hmm. we must be able to talk about this publicly. We need to, Yeah. but, um, but we need to do it in a way that, that people can feel, um, respected, loved, and then also safe and not, you know, like hurt from other situations. So, yeah. um, anyways, that's, uh, how we're going to approach <laughs> this. Um, first I think let's define some key terms. Yeah. We have to make sure we're all thinking the same things as we say words while we're <laughs> yeah. having this conversation. Cause that's, I think half our battles are the fact that we're all saying something mm -hmm. that also is a little different because it it all means something different to each person talking past so each other. this is how we're going to define these terms for today's episode right, right, right. so you know where we're coming from okay so first off um sex is either of the two main categories male and female into which humans and most other living things are divided on the basis of their reproductive functions mm -hmm. so that is how you're born you're sexed at birth at birth mm -hmm. right yeah like so so that's that's what that is mm -hmm. gender on the other hand and so they're not synonymous they're not the same thing right. and this is a very important key to this whole conversation right gender is a socially constructed role behavior expression and identities of girls women boys men and gender diverse people mm -hmm. so there's this aspect of it that's socially constructed yeah for instance we have a sense of what women act like in a society yeah. what men act like in a society what boys do what girls do um this shifts and varies through generations through um different cultures and so um yeah. and so it is not a hard line but but we do also understand that there seems to be congruence between gender and sex. Yes. That like boys who are sexed male mm -hmm. act a certain way, maybe yeah. naturally. Yeah. Maybe it is brought up together and it's conditioned mm -hmm. or, or, it's, uh, or it's constructed, yeah. but it may not be entirely constructed. Maybe some things mm -hmm. are um, just like inherent. Yeah. So, um, and so, and that's a very difficult way to under, to, to see like to what extent yeah. is it constructed and to what extent is it not? <laughs> yeah. Like for instance, you can argue with like a, as an egalitarian, you can argue with complementarians all the time. Right. Oh, well men are naturally made to be leaders. leaders. Yeah. But then is it, is that the case or is it just we're in a society that's patriarchal right. that has actually put in the, uh, in, into the, the Built sense into of, the constructs, into of, the constructs that that's what it is. Yeah. And so if we were not in that, if we were in a matriarchal society, mm -hmm. would leadership come from women? And then would that be the thing that's natural? Right. Depending on where we end up. Well, even like, um, you know, what's that? There's like a weird book or something that like men are spaghetti or men are waffles and women are spaghetti. Okay. Have you heard that? No. Okay. So it like relates to like a generalization of like how men and women think. Yeah. Boxing it's like, versus, yeah. Like yeah. men put things in a box mm -hmm. like a waffle and then women are like all of their emotion, all their thoughts are always touching and always like blah, 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 blah like all the time and they interact and they do yeah. all the things. And yeah. I am a waffle. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like I am much more of a like logical person. Like I'm not very emotional. You are ontologically a waffle. Yes. You're not a human. Yes. I am actually I a okay. physical waffle. If you actually saw me, I'm actually a waffle and I've <laughs> yes. been a waffle this whole time. Yeah, so gotcha. uh, like mentally I'm w w in this comparison is I'm a waffle. And so right, I right, remember right. like when I was a teenager and it, my, it threw my mom for a loop because mm. I did not process like 
a quote unquote girl. Right. Like I had not, like I processed a lot. And so my dad did a lot of like helping bridge that Mm -hmm. gap because my dad was like a man, a waffle apparently. Right. And so (laughs) it's like those little things where it's like, I'm not technically what would be the majority of like, oh, that's how women are. Um, because of like those kinds of social gender constructs. And so, and so the problem with that is, um, to, to think of a construct of gender, they're going to be by necessity kind of wrapped up in generalizations. Yes. And so, and then whenever something breaks a generalization, then we start thinking like, oh, well, what's going on? And that, mm-hmm. that's when things can get, um, dicey, you know what I mean? Yes. And, um, and that's where we get a lot of our, our constructs, but like, but you thinking like a waffle, you're still feminine in the yes. way you act. Right. Yes. And so, um, but like what if a a woman doesn't act that feminine Mm -hmm. that's you know does that mean she is oh yeah like when they're raised and like they're small and they like to play sports and you're like that's a tomboy yes and you're like okay because god forbid a girl plays sports and likes to go outside and so there's there's a huge question right there does that mean that she's actually meant to be a boy or does that mean that our our concept of what a girl is Mm -hmm. doing is too limited. Oh yeah. Well, when I was a when I was a kid, I was a huge tomboy. Well, one, I there was like I had gotten my feelings hurt by a girl, like very like bro, friends that were girls, like very early on. So I like only hung out with like male friends for like my entire elementary school years, mm. and I like played sports on the playground, like did all these things, like I was hanging out with the guys, whatever. And I remember having a full scale mental breakdown one time because I was like. I want to dress like a boy. Like I want to be like a boy, whatever. And my mom like had to walk me through this whole thing where she's like, you don't want (laughs) to, you're not a boy. Like you just fit in. Like you feel like you fit in here. Yeah. It's not about, and then I had to like literally go through this whole process of like reconciling my view of women (laughs) (laughs) because like my feelings had been hurt by like girls when I was very young. Mm. And so I was like, but my mom was never like, Oh, she must be a boy. Even though I was articulating in a way that was like, Oh, I'm, I'm saying, like yeah. I want to be a boy. Yeah. And it was, it actually was like, because I felt so excluded by girls and that's where I felt safest was with men or, or the, with boys, I guess. Cause I was literally nine. Yeah. So she saw what, what we're saying here is like, she didn't think that you were a boy, mm-hmm. but she thought that hers and your view of, uh, of, femininity was too was, limited yes was right. very limited and like i went to obviously the baptist school and so there was a lot of how <laughs> there was a belief of how girls should be and how right. you know things should operate and so i think that we do kind of need to be more mm-hmm. like we don't need to not have such a narrow box that we fit everybody in that if they're not specifically acting this way doing these things dressing this way that they're right. not like <laughs> masculine or feminine in a, yeah. in a specific way. But that is different than saying they're not sexed a certain way, like if they're right. male or female. Mm-hmm. And so, and this is actually where the problem of, um, occur within transgenderism. Right. So, and, um, the words used for is gender dysphoria. So this is a psychological distress that results from an incongruence between mm-hmm. one's sex assigned at birth and one's gender identity. Right. And so um, that's dysphoria. So one of the issues that I think we see right away is, and this this I've heard a lot. Mm-hmm. One of the things about transgenderism, other than LGB, is that there's something seems to be logically a foul. Like something doesn't logically make sense. Yeah. And it was hard to put my finger on it, and like I couldn't, you know. And and I talked to people, and I talked to a lot of friends that were in the LGBT community, yeah. and they just like they didn't really talk about it. They talked like they they were like I don't know, you know this and that, but like because LGB that makes a lot more sense. Sexual preference, like you're attracted to the same sex, like that's yeah. not there's nothing like difficult about that, you know, like yeah, like that's that's something that's kind of easy enough to process through it's easy to process easy to conceptualize yeah so like oh i don't experience that but other people too i can see that yes but when somebody is saying that gender dysphoria is happening i think there's something that happens logically mm-hmm. that's like i don't understand it not just because it's not my own experience yeah but there's it seems to not make sense yeah and so one thing that gets brought up all the time and we're kind of like talking about it a little bit here is okay if someone is sexed one way at birth, but they believe that their gender identity is opposite, is Mm -hmm. different than that. How can they actually know that? Right. So if you're only enter this world into one body, how would you know what it is like to live as a woman or a male of the, uh, of the opposite gender, essentially, if you're only in that one way, aren't you just like kind of assuming by analogy, what you think the other sex process is like, or thinks like, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one of the issues that I've heard a lot. Like I've heard a lot of yeah. people bring this up. It's like, how can you possibly know that? Yeah. 
But that's less of the thing that I think was problematic with me. And so let's let's give gender dysphoria. Let's just say that that mm. is the case. Yeah. That, that there's a lot of psychological distress that they are born one sex assigned at birth and then um and their gender identity is the opposite. Yeah. So let, let's give this as a situation. Mm-hmm. First of all, going to be very difficult because this sense of dysphoria can be so intense that it can lead people to depression and anxiety and have a harmful impact on life. Right. Some people even get suicidal. That's mm-hmm. why you cannot be, you know, haphazardly talking about this as if it's just, you know, oh, it's nonsense, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, because this is a very real experience. It's a very real experience. Yeah. So whether you think that there's some philosophical issues going on or whatnot, mm-hmm. um, these people have distress, and that's yeah. for sure. And they're living with it, with it distress. And so, mm-hmm. so if we give this, if we say that gender dysphoria is the reality um, of what's going on, then I think there was another issue that, that didn't make sense to me. And it was the issue of embodiment. Yeah. So, okay. If you're assigned one sex at birth, mm-hmm. we're saying essentially your external self is we're going to say male here, right? Yeah. So if this person is externally born and like like their external self is male, yeah. then they believe that their gender identity is female, like their internal self is yeah. female. And so one of the issues is that transgenderism seems to prioritize the internal over the external. Right. So right now you have two things that are different. So which one, the internal or the external, do you uh, change to bring relief yeah. to your dysphoria. Mm-hmm. And I think that the going thing is for transgender folks is to change the body yeah. and not to change the mind. Because yeah. if you change the mind, that would be like going to therapy and stuff like that. Yeah. But for a Christian perspective, mm-hmm. they would say the opposite usually. You go to therapy, you don't change the body. Right. So that was, that was the thing of like, why are they prioritizing one or the other? Mm -hmm. Why are people who are transgender prioritizing the internal self? And why are Christians prioritizing the external, like not changing the external? So like, so that, that difficulty. And I think I figured out what it might be. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is up for discussion. (laughs) So what it might be, I think it is that transgender folks and, uh, and people who are in this school of thinking Mm -hmm. view the internal self as the true self Mm -hmm. and the external self as your shell or your yeah. your exterior not your true self but like the thing that's housing your true your self. true self yeah and so so the mindset here is oh i'm truly this but my housing it got is mixed up wrong yeah right and so what i need to do is change the housing mm-hmm. right and they'll say you know even if they get surgeries and stuff like that, there's many, many testimonies where like they they don't feel like totally at ease, but they feel better. more, they feel better. Mm-hmm. Like it alleviates some of that distress. Yeah. Um, but the same thing's true of um, therapy. Yeah. Like you don't feel all the way better, but you, you, you do relieve some <laughs> yes. of the, the distress. Yes. And so a Christian perspective would say often, and I, and I don't know if this is across board, but like you hear this very often, mm-hmm. that we are holistic, that our bodies and our spiritual selves or our internal selves are both good. Like mm-hmm. when God made man, he made him male and female, he created them. Yeah. Like he made us with body and spirit. Yeah. He made us like with, uh, with both of these facets, an mm-hmm. internal and external. And he called all of that, all of which we are good. Good. And mm-hmm. very good. Yeah. And so I think a Christian mindset is ambivalent does not want to change the external yeah. because then you're changing the temple of God. You're yeah. changing the thing that is you. You're actually changing yourself. Yeah. You're not changing your, your shell. Yeah. You're not changing your, uh, your external you know, thing that's holding your true self. Mm-hmm. You're changing yourself, your yeah. true self. Yeah. So your inside and your outside are true. Mm-hmm. And so I think what the Christians opt to is, okay, if you are feeling dysphoria, do the thing that's least invasive yeah. since neither of them are going to give you complete relief. Therapy is least invasive. Yeah. Whereas people who hold the mindset, they don't want to do therapy per se mm-hmm. because they don't want to change their true self. That, that's like, that's like meddling or <laughs> yeah. like, like a conversion therapy or some sort yeah. of like, of like changing your true self when all you really need to do is modify your body. Yeah. I hear that. What do you think of this? What do you think of that idea? I think, well, one, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the the verses and stuff that we even see in like Psalm where it's like, you know, God knit you together in your mother's womb, like mm-hmm. we were fearfully, wonderfully made, that kind of thing. I think w- those kinds of verses do kind of confirm this belief that 
our external person was part of God's intentional design right. for each person yeah. that, um, and I think that's where we kind of get into the slippery slope with transgenderism is the fact that like to say that you're in the wrong body is to imply that there was a mistake yeah. in your creation. Right. And I think that Christians have a hard time with that because as we're saying, you know, as a God who's perfect and that he's intentional and crafts mm-hmm. each one of us, that that can get real slippery theologically yeah. of uh, uh, of somebody who makes mistakes. And so I think that Christians take put, we've seen and have placed a huge priority on this holistic view of yeah. people as mind, body, soul. Like we're all one and that's how we were made and that's how we were created. Um, but I totally can see how transgender person sees that. Oh, the other the, way. Ex- yeah, yeah. Like externally, like, Oh, something's been made incorrectly or there's something wrong here. And so in order to fix this problem or resolve this issue, like this is the, these are the steps that I'm going to take because I'm just like, this is just yeah. a body. And yeah. so I kind of like this, it's what matters is how I feel internally is my soul right. is my like mind and how I feel. Um, and so I can see why that is something that makes a lot of sense is like the prioritization yeah. of this internal self mm-hmm. as a guiding. So there's a couple of things too, that I think we would hear as a response. Mm-hmm. One, well, first, I think the reason why this episode is even called is transgenderism Gnostic mm-hmm. is because this dualism where the internal self and the external self are different and the external self is inferior to the internal self yeah. and the internal self is prioritized. That's Gnostic. And, yeah. that's, and that was deemed um, heretical a long time ago in the, you know, in the early church. And, yeah. so, and so that's why it's not typical for a Christian anthropology to view it that way. Yeah. And I think that's why, that's, the, that's why Christians have philosophical issues understanding transgenderism i think yeah. because it seems what they're saying is implicitly gnostic yeah that being said there was a couple of things that i think we would hear some really powerful retorts against one to say that god doesn't make mistakes but what about people with um deformities that are right. born and uh, or like mental handicaps or yeah. or like this is where we get our theology of disability where it really takes a lot of nuance to even understand this right um you know to understand that people are fearfully wonderfully made even still, yeah, or like even because, or might even celebrate that. Mm-hmm. That's a, I think a pretty major response that people will have. Yeah, but you know we don't really like bat an eye about somebody doing a surgery. Like let's say um, a baby has a cleft palate or something like oh, yeah. that, mm-hmm. and so there's a corrective surgery that will do yeah. to to fix that or whatever. Mm-hmm. And we don't bat an eye about that. Yeah, then, like cosmetic procedures, or like a cosmetic like that, procedure. Yeah. And so th- I think the folks that hold to this view of transgenderism would say this is essentially a cosmetic procedure. Yep. You know, because their external is not who they truly are. So it's yeah. cosmetic, you know, mm-hmm. and um, just make it a line. But then I think what we would say there is like, no, this is not a cosmetic procedure. You're starting to mess with your assigned sex identity yeah. in general. So it has to do with identity. I think everybody knows that, mm-hmm. but but there's like greater weight to it if you have a, a holistic view of anthropology between yeah. internal and external rather than a dualistic view where the external is, is something that can be changed. Right. You know, mm-hmm. there's also another thing that I, I could hear is like, well, what about people who modify their bodies? Um, what about piercings, oh, yeah. tattoos, piercings and stuff tattoos, like, yeah. which we both have. We, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I got tattoos and uh, you got both, right? I both. Yeah. Yeah. And so. I dye my hair. And you dye hair. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did not dye my hair. The Lord dyed my hair for me. <laughs> I started going white very early on. I was 16. It's kind so of a, it's kind of slow. I I hope so because uh, Mila, my daughter, makes fun of me hard all the time. Really, all the time. She'd be calling me so old all the time, and then she was like, like, "Just wait, for Daddy, it, kid. you're old, and mommy's not old." I'm like, I'm you're like, dang, like, like, okay. Didn't know the color of my hair determined my age, but whatever. Yeah, we're both in our 30s, okay. It's not. I'm not that old, okay. And then she was like, "Yep, you are," and I'm like, "Man, that's bad." So she gets you. The whole time, too. Like, since she was, like, three, she'd been making fun of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, like, the whole time. She's nine Said, now. Said, leave me alone, child. <laughs> yep. She's too much like me. You know what I mean? Mm. Anyways, so if you change yourself externally, I think Christians rationalize this pretty easily yeah. with these are these are external adornments. These are, yeah. I'm, I'm not changing my body, I'm adorning it. I'm not changing my identity. 
right by dyeing my hair right right you're but and you're adorning so even if you think about like your body is like your a temple. beautification kind of situation yeah. of it mm-hmm. yeah your po- your body is a temple mm-hmm. i just painted the walls a little bit you know what i mean or, yeah. or something like that yeah right like so so that where it seems like like you're adorning something and that that's typically i think the rationalization people will say yeah whereas getting a, a surgery that changes your gender yeah that's more than just like doing you're, you're breaking down some walls here right like this mm-hmm. is not just a cosmetic thing this yeah. is a you're breaking the foundation of mm-hmm. the of the temple right yeah the, and so I think that's kind of how that's understood. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? I, I mean, I agree. I think I see it as that. And there are people who are on the side of things where they wouldn't get tattoos or piercings and there's their that's own argument yeah. <laughs> of whether or not Christians should do that kind of stuff. But um, mm-hmm. so that's a whole other, you know, piece of the puzzle. But yeah, I mean, I dye my hair. I've gotten piercings i've gotten you know tattoos i've never had any cosmetic procedures done mm-hmm. and I, but i know people who have and for them it's it's oh they're not going in with an intention to change their identity their identity yeah they yeah. don't go in and they're like oh i'm going to be a different person now that i get my nose job mm-hmm. or i'm going to i'm going in to dye my hair with the intention of changing my name and how i'm known yeah. and how you will address me yeah um it's definitely more of a <laughs> yeah it's like a cosmetic thing and i think that comes out of like some people do it out of insecurity and they want to feel mm-hmm. more confident in who they are and how they were made yeah. um some people do it out of a like a cosmetic appreciation they just like how it looks um all that kind of stuff but it's definitely it's not so much done in the manner in which to change how they were made yeah or how they're viewed by like fundamentally like they wouldn't change yeah. That and aspect. we could even say, you know, if, if a change like that, even a cosmetic change like that happens because of um, insecurities, you would hope that they would find security in Christ. Like yeah. that's, that's the thing that you would hope happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't think there's a hard, fast rule that we want to give to people like no cosmetic surgery or, yeah. or like, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I know if I would advising, if I was advising like my daughter and she, yeah. and she was felt uncomfortable about something, I would try to show her, um, how she's beautiful yeah. and how, how God intended her to be just yeah. the way she is and stuff. Well, I had to go, I went to therapy this last year cause I had pretty bad like body dysmorphia in the sense of how I was like perceiving different aspects of my like body, my face, my skin, whatever. And so I straight up like went to therapy because I was mm. having like literally a mental block with how I would and it manifested in like picking like i was skin picking like i was like it was nuts and so i went in to like do therapy for it because it's something that i was like okay what is going on here like and (laughs) in processing that like so many other aspects of like why i am this way like came out and like Mm -hmm. for in Mm -hmm. a lot of ways like i still struggle with it to some degree but like much less now in the sense because i was like oh i'm learning why right i'm like this and it uh-huh. re- like whittles down to a lot of like perfectionism issues and like yeah the way like w- obnoxiously high standards i hold myself to because of things i've experienced and whatever and so there are ways that i have you know the things that i do to make myself feel more secure mm-hmm. in, in who i am because that helps you know to some degree ease the body dysmorphia but i've also like had to genuinely spiritually battle that too yeah like it's it's a both and yeah. like i do things physically uh-huh. and then but i'm also like oh like lord you're in this like praying through it stuff like that where mm-hmm. And that's just as real. And so I'm like, as someone who's had issues where I feel like I've done cosmetic things to like help me feel more secure in who I am. There's also that spiritual piece where I'm like, Lord, help me through it. Like mentally, I got to be in a different space because this is nuts. And so I think that there's those things can coexist and like getting and feeling more secure and Uh stuff is not a bad thing either. And uh, I, I think I think that's real, and I think that's something that we we all deal with to some degree. Yeah. Um. And especially in such a image based society that we're we're in continually more and more image based. Yes. The issue that transgender folks have is in some ways like that, and like majorly compounded too. Yeah. And so it's not fair to kind of like compare issues and compare different things, mm-hmm. and um and so we don't want to do that. But like I, I think what I do want to highlight is that like transgender folks are dealing with some real stuff. Yeah. It's not easy, but I think what is helpful about understanding this and understanding if there is a a sense of anthropological dualism versus a holistic anthropology, Mm -hmm. that difference can actually help us understand how to even deal with the issues in the church setting or something like that. Like for instance, if we know these differences in anthropology, it's going to actually change our apologetics Mm -hmm. because then we're not going to be maybe as condemning 
as if they're functioning under ours. So like, yeah. like we assume that a transgender person is denying God. Yeah. Like, like, nope, God made me wrong or this and that. Mm-hmm. And you know, I hate my body or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like, but that's not necessarily what is going on in their heads. Yeah. What they might be saying like, Hey, this external thing, mm-hmm. which is like a cosmetic thing or something like that. Like you could think of it that way. Yeah. It just doesn't match with my internal self. Mm-hmm. And, um, and if it did, I would feel better. Yeah. I think then our apologetic should be to show, um, like if we're talking about a Christian perspective, is to show people dealing with uh, gender dysphoria that their bodies are good and yeah. intended mm-hmm. and beautiful and them and who they are. Yeah. I think that is probably the best way to approach it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you can't force anything not on anybody. Like that's not our position ever to do. Yeah. But we can be a friend, we can be a good witness and we can um, talk to people and walk through situations with them. But like, but in this situation, if somebody's dealing with that, maybe that's the approach we do. We show them what a, a holistic anthropology entails. Yeah. That's getting at the heart of the issue. The heart mm-hmm. of the issue is that anthropology. So if you can show them that, then the other things can work themselves out. You know, yeah. hey, when God God made you he made you body and spirit and he called that very good yeah i mean what what do you think yeah i think practically with church application i i think is because not everyone who comes into church spaces and stuff is is gonna want to sit there and be yapped at no theologically for yeah. <laughs> why they're wrong or whatever why we think they're wrong for, for sure however many like no one ever got argued into the kingdom like no. No one ever lost an argument. It was like, fine, I'll follow Jesus. <laughs> um you win. I get it. <laughs> so I think that like the best you know jesus worked best in relationship Mm -hmm. and that's how he modeled his ministry is is deep intentional relationship with people Mm -hmm. and i think as christians as pastors as leaders like we also need to model relationship Mm -hmm. and um that our voice and our relation like our voice matters more and carries more weight when there's a relationship equity that's been built and so i think that I'm not going to tell anybody how to run their church. I'm not going to tell anybody mm-hmm. like what they need to be doing. But I think something that would be a really good place to start is if you have a transgender person who comes into your, into your church, dude, that's a huge deal Yeah, because we know that probably costs them something yeah. to come into a church space. And the very least that we can do is meet them in that and meet them in that space and meet them in that gap. Um, Because who knows what it took for them to come in to that room. And I pray we're not the people who push people that we don't, you know, agree with out of church walls and out of the kingdom because yeah, like it's very like the Pharisees would do that. Yeah. Like we want to be people who reflect the love of Jesus. It's not compromising of anybody's position. It's not affirming anything. It's not, um, making anything okay. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it does bridge a gap of you're still a person who has value and worth. Right, right. It shows them more that you care about them than anything else. Yes. And help that person feel cared for and loved and valued. Yeah, this is not a tit for tat game. Right. This is a real person that Mm -hmm. we should be really genuinely invested in caring for. That's probably a good step. I would agree. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a good conversation. That's just scratching the surface. Tip of the iceberg, man. Yeah. This is such a, and, and like how churches can relate with transgender folks when they walk through the door and um, like, you know, there's, there's so much, so many questions that are asked there Yeah. that I get asked all the time. And it's just one of those, like the answers there are not like clear, you know no. what I mean? Like, like you have to use uh, pastoral wisdom. Mm-hmm. You have to kind of understand what is right in a, in a contextual situation and, yeah. and um, how to be a person who seeks the truth and can say things like what we said even today, like, Hey, I think that's wrong. If you're not thinking that the body is you, mm-hmm. you know, and like, but be able to still love them and, and kind of, um, you know, treat everybody with kind of that respect. And yeah. yeah, it's, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough road and it is one of our defining issues in our age today. Yeah. It's something that comes up all the time. So the one thing I do know we need to do is talk about it. Yes. Yeah. I agree. So, well, hopefully this starts a good conversation. Definitely doesn't end it. Opens the door to a good door. pathway of conversation. Well, friends, this uh, podcast episode is brought to you by the School of Theology and Ministry at Life Pacific University. Yes. Um, we're thankful for them. <laughs> yeah. The supporting uh, <laughs> support the sponsorship. Praise God. Yeah. So, um, all right, friends. We'll see you next week and we'll talk to you soon. See you later.